this many people that enjoy talking about or hearing about science and math. So thanks to goes to Nick Chura for making this gathering possible. Zero over zero. Now there's a you know the nice thing about zero over zero, you can make it uh, you can prove that it e make it equal anything you want, right? <laughs> and when you have a fraction and you have a result, uh, how do you check the result? <laughs> you multiply the denominator times the result. Well zero over zero, you want it to be seven. <laughs> Check it out. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth check out. Seven times zero is zero. So there, there you go. So, and the, the thing that uh, we're going to talk about the, uh, the uh, 1700s, uh, math students were often assigned busy work kind of problems just to keep them occupied during class. I don't, surely they don't do this. Do they least want to do this? Yeah. <laughs> busy work problems? I don't think so. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> one, uh, one popular uh, type of problem, busy work kind of a problem, uh, that uh, they would give students would be adding a long list of numbers. Like, let's say, add all the numbers between 1 and 100. Gauss's method to check this. Okay. 
How many uh, how many pairs are there? How many pairs do you have there uh, in that series? Yeah. I don't know. It looks like oh, hundred pairs. You've got actually a hundred pairs, right? Okay. So if you multiply a hundred times a hundred one. And uh, and that's how come the, the, how come is that the answer? No. Why? Just twice. twice. So we just really want to add this one this series once, right? That was so fast you counted it twice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so anyway, so you have to divide this by two to ensure that you get fifty fifty. Okay, fifty fifty is the answer. Great, good job. How do you do it? I just multiply it by 100 and then divide it by 2. Yeah. Okay, so you were using the acid method then you were saying, okay. Yeah. Yeah. 1, 3, 6. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay, okay. I, the, uh, is that what you were doing? You were, you were getting ready to... Okay, you were just, But you knew the formula right away. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking before, so was it when you to like in elementary school? Uh-huh. Really? Or is that one of like a real story that was kind of apocryphal? I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah, it could be apocryphal. The nice thing about uh, looking at it this way, it's easy to get a general formula for it. Because instead of 100, uh, if you, so you just want to add this sequence up to some arbitrary n, uh, then uh, this would be like n plus 1, this would be n. So your general formula would be uh, n times n plus 1 over 2. And that would be the general formula. So you could add uh, any, any sequence of numbers. I mean, any uh, starting the natural number, that up any, any arbitrary uh, result. Okay, so this is adding the first 100 numbers. And this was with, uh, with Gauss in the 1700s. Well, in the 1900s, uh, another young math student came along, developed a theory for adding these uh, the same sequence of numbers, and he was from India.
So let's, uh, let's, let's just focus as we go through the steps of his uh, book. Oh, boy. Okay, I don't Can you read that at all? Okay. The uh, first line says a, uh, another way of finding the constant is as follows. So let us take the, the series 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, etc., and let C be its constant. So you let me C be the, the sum of the series. Okay. And then uh, he multiplies C by 4. So 4C equals, and you see, 4 plus 8, and so on. Just multiplying this series by 4. Okay. These are both kind of infinite series, right? So now you have a, another infinite series. And then what he does, he subtracts this infinite series from this infinite series. He subtracts this line from this line. So you get C minus 4C, you get minus 3C. 1 minus nothing, 1. <coughs> 2 minus 4, minus 2. Uh, uh, 3 minus nothing, 3, and then so on. You get minus 4, you get uh, and so on. And then about here, a miracle occurs. Yeah. <laughs> and then he replaces this, this is an infinite series too, but he replaces this infinite series by this expression. So let's, uh, let's take a closer look at the mirror. Okay, so far, so good, right? So far, it seems like it's pretty logical. And nothing to argue with so far. So uh, let's, uh, let's take a look at uh, what this is. And let's, let's we, we read enough of good writing and stuff. Let's, uh, and Wikipedia, they actually retyped uh, the thing. Let's, let's put uh, more of the, a little easier to read. Okay. And here's his steps. The final C to be that, and multiply it by four, and then subtract and gets this series here. Turns out this series is a, a little more manageable than this one. And I think that's probably the only reason he wanted to multiply by four and subtract, is because he ends up with a series that's a little more manageable. This one, you can look up in a, in a table of, uh, of math, uh, a math table, uh, and actually find an expression that you can replace this whole infinite series by just an expression. And that's uh, that's what he did. That's the miracle. He just uh, looks up in a table or, and then uh, just simply replaces that whole series with a uh, with an expression, this function here. Just to give you a little flavor for, this is what in the days before computer and program calculus, everybody carried these, these manual, these uh, math tables around. This is the, the CRC standard math table, 11th edition. And this is, I think this is printed in 1956 or 57. This incidentally belonged to my wife's uh, sister. And a, 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 you know, she actually used it when she was going to college. And uh, it's interesting on the title page, it even gives the price three dollars in the United States, three dollars and fifty cents outside the United States. <laughs> and CRC stands for Chemical Rubber uh, Publishing Company. So this, these books, the CRC books, were finally referred to as the Rubber Handbook. The text is broken. Anyway, this is this is everybody had these. Everybody had these. science, engineering, math. Everybody had these these uh, these tables. Well, you look back. Uh, and here, here's a, uh, where you can see a bunch of series that are listed. And the idea, just simply thumb through the, thumb through the series until you find one that matches what you're trying to, uh, to, uh, to replace with. Well, you go down to all these series, these are the binomial series. And you get a series here that looks a lot like the one that we're trying to uh, replace with an expression. So like 1, minus 2, plus 3, minus 4, and so on. Exactly what we're looking for. <coughs> and uh, it has an x here. 
this is the expression you replace it with, and if we just simply replace it with that expression, 1 plus x to the all to the minus 2, and then just put x equals 1, we have a valid result as long as x squared less than 1. If x squared is not less than 1, this is not going to convert, okay? So that's the condition. Well, that's what Ramanujan did. He replaced that whole uh, series with the uh, with that expression. Uh, 1 plus uh, 1 over 1 plus 1 uh, squared. Well, 1 over 2 squared, you get 1 fourth. And uh, so you have 1 fourth equals minus 3c. So you solve for c, and you come up with c is equal to minus 1 fourth. Now, you're convinced. What did you plug in for a Pardon? What did you plug in for a uh, 1. So then x have to be greater than 1? What can you say? <laughs> you didn't follow, you didn't follow the CRC. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> the CRC is pretty, pretty, uh, you know, pretty uh, irrefutable. Mm -hmm. I mean, they double check those. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so anyway, I, I think uh, uh, Jacob just pointed out kind of a real flaw in the proof. Because uh, you can't, uh, if this series is, uh, is uh, that only converges uh, for x less than 1, x squared less than 1, well, my goodness, uh, you can't just put 1 in there. Is, is 1 less than 1? Almost. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there's, there's one potential problem with the uh, with the uh, with that proof, and uh, and I, I I happen to have another uh, uh, gift card, ten dollar gift card from uh, uh, Starbucks here, and it goes to the first student or tutor in here that can find another part of this proof that you're really a little uneasy about. What's that? When he multiplies the, the, the series by 4 and um, subtracts them from each other, he doesn't subtract them at the 1 to 1 ratio. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what's going on here? You multiply them by 4, well, there's no argument that that's, that's multiplying by 4, right? But uh, he kind of puts them in here in a particular way. And you can kind of maybe see why he would do it, because you want to end up with this uh, manageable uh, sequence. But is that, uh, is that really, are you, I mean, is that legal? Can, can you just arbitrarily, can you just arbitrarily uh, put those where you want? You're, it's kind of like you're, arbit you're arbitrarily putting zeros in. And suppose you say, well, suppose uh, suppose you say, well, maybe suppose he did do it in a, in a say the regular way, in order, you would get a different series. Well, you might get a different formula. It may be like zero over zero. You can make it equal anything you want. Okay, so that wouldn't be too convincing. So uh, I think you found another flaw in that. Let me graduate. Oh, here you go. Thanks. Good observation to the uh, well. So anyway, and, uh, and, and, and no one's really saying that uh, if you add up all these numbers, you get minus one twelve. It's just that you go through this process. Now you can firm this up. You can make it more. You can make it a little bit more rigorous. And uh, and the Wikipedia article actually uh, actually suggests how you can do that. One way to remedy this situation, just arbitrarily putting the zero in where you want, is to, uh, I mean, if you uh, introduce a, a dependence on some function in the series, the numbers are is just a uh, just such a number into the minus s. You make that you can make that the uh, you can make that uh, your function. And then if you let S be a uh, complex variable, 
uh, then it kind of uh, it ensured that only light turned were at it. So it ensured that you really do just put the term thing where you're supposed to put it in. Uh, a, a year or two ago, uh, a, a, student, a person who used to be a student here and then taught here part time and is now teaching at the Portland State, uh, a person named Shu, gave a talk. And uh, he, he did something like this. He, his talk uh, had to do with the series of uh, 1 over n squared. And he showed that that, uh, that sequence, he, did, uh, he showed that that sequence actually converges to a, to a number like pi squared over 6 or something. Well, he went through this, this sort of a process. I was hoping he'd be here today, but if you have any question on the render of that, I'll just direct you to shoot. Yeah. He did a really good talk on that. And not only that, the, uh, the approach he used, you can use that same approach and actually show that these kind of series, like 10 to the minus s, you can, you can put in terms entirely in terms of, of prime numbers. So you can show these sequences entirely can be expressed in terms of prime numbers. So it ties it to the uh, behavior of prime numbers. Is that like the Euler product? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. In fact, uh, this function, uh, uh, this function becomes like the uh, Euler function. But then, if you go through this process uh, where you uh, uh, introduce it in complex variables, it becomes the Riemann zeta function. Like you said, the Euler zeta function, it becomes the Riemann zeta function. That you're getting into. See, when you start getting into that stuff, you're getting into pretty abstract stuff. We're getting into number theory, prime numbers, pretty abstract stuff. Now it would be kind of nice to, to know or if see if this same sequence, uh, when we get this minus 112, that this same sequence also showed up in, in maybe a less abstract places. There's a, a, a joke told by some mathematicians. Not all that funny, but um, <laughs> yeah. something like this. Uh, before the universe uh, existed, the only way you had of solving problems was abstract math, pure math. There's no universe, what else do you have? And what else do you have? Say there's no universe. Everything is nothing but abstract, right? Okay. But once, see, I told you one more. <laughs> uh, but once you had the, uh, once the universe, we have the universe, then you have other uh, possibilities. You can use applied mathematics. And it turns out that this same sequence, 1 plus 2 plus 3, so on, this same sequence also turns out to describe an actual physical property of the universe. One, two, three. Turned out to actually describe a, a, a physical property of the universe that's measurable, by the way. Okay? So see, you can tie this relationship into a physical property. Have you ever uh, wondered why in the universe is there something rather than nothing? Not the sort of question you ask yourself every day, <laughs> okay, right? But if you ever want to, we've all kind of asked, pondered that question at some point. Why is there something out there rather than nothing? Well, the uh, theory of quantum mechanics has an answer for that. The, the quantum mechanics is the physics theory that explains all the components in your smartphone works. So. It has a lot of credibility. Okay. And according to quantum mechanics, you can't have nothing in the universe because nothing is unstable. The, uh, <laughs> think about that. Okay. Now the, uh, there, there was a song a few years ago called the Bohemian, uh, Bohemian Rhapsody. How many people have heard of that song? Uh, one of the recurring lyrics in that song is uh, nothing really matters. 
Well, whoever penned those words was on to a fundamental property of the universe. In the universe, nothing really does matter. <laughs> let's, uh, let's talk about nothing uh, for a while. Let's suppose that we look at the unoccupied space in this, uh, in this room. It's pretty much filled with nothing, right? We really want to make it feel with good quality nothing. What would we have to do? What extra, what extra yeah. stuff would we have to take in here to really make this unoccupied space feel with nothing? Nice. Yeah, we'll go back and come back. Take some people out. Take a what? And kick some people out. <laughs> well, let's keep just the unoccupied. We don't want to, we can't, we don't want to lose anybody here. So just the unoccupied space in here, like just this space up in here. If we hook a vacuum pump up to that, a really good, say we hook the best vacuum pump uh, on the planet uh, and get it down so that we suck out all the matter, all the known matter out of that. So we have just a, as good of a vacuum as, say, interstellar space. Now you still have all these pesky cell phone signals, okay, moving around here. So you'd have to get rid of those too. But you can do it, put a shield around this, a metal shield. So no, no radio signals, nothing, no electromagnetic, pure nothing. Okay, just pure nothing. This should be, you would think, what you know, all you have left is just space. No matter, no uh, signals, uh, no energy signals, just just space. Empty space. Should be some of the most inert real estate you know, in the universe. So if you took two tiny little metal plates and you know, suspended them in here as a, like a probe, uh, nothing should happen to those. There's nothing there. Yeah. But you wouldn't expect it. You say nothing should have to be inert. But when you start zooming in on this uh, empty space, uh, remember quantum mechanics, you, know, you can't have nothing because nothing is unstable. When something is unstable, stuff stops popping up out of nowhere. The closer you look, the more stuff starts popping up on the nose. Where's nowhere? Right here next to nothing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so when you put uh, when you put the, the little tiny little metal uh, plates here, uh, where you would expect nothing to happen, what you actually find is that uh, a lot of stuff is going on, and uh, those plates actually experience a force, and the force they experience is uh, another page out of the Wikipedia. Uh, this is what you actually, uh, here's our two little plates. <coughs> it's been in the vacuum, and when you really look close to this vacuum, it's just, it's seeding a bit of activity. All these waves and particles are popping up out of nowhere. They don't stick around very long. They're pretty ephemeral. Uh, they're, they're there long enough to make their presence known. And they're pre they make their presence known by causing these plates to move together. Okay, so let's say we want to do a thought experiment. And we want to actually do this experiment. Actually, let's, let's, let's hire a mechanical engineer to actually build it. Okay? And, uh, and uh, let's, say, let's hire a baby. Someone who's recently graduated looking for work. And we can do some crowdsource funding. Maybe we can get around. It at least 20 bucks. <laughs> Maybe we can even raise enough to pay off all those student loans, too. We're going to hire Jacob. <laughs> We're going to hire Jacob to, uh, to build this. Now, one of the things uh, that Jacob's going to ask, he's going to want to know before he actually builds some hardware, he's going to want to know well, how strong an attack are you looking for? Okay. So you want to know how much energy does this represent? Well, these things that are popping up out of nowhere, they have wavelengths, they're like photons, and uh, any wavelength, any wavelength at all can pop up out of here, ranging from some maximum wavelength corresponding to the dimensions of the apparatus. It's an infinitesimally small wavelength. Well, that's, a, that's an infinite set. If you can have a, a photon of a wavelength ranging from some maximum amount to some infinitesimally small, any any value, any wavelength, that's an infinite set. Each one of those little photons has an energy. If you want to add up all the possible energy 
that represented by all those ways it could. They don't all be, or they all come up at the same time, but if they did, well, we'd be toast for one thing. I mean, if this really happened, if this ever happened in the universe, because that would that would add up to how much? If you if you add up all the energy, each one has a finite amount of energy, and you have a different set, it would add up to a good number, right? And then call the vacuum catastrophe. If that ever happened, called the vacuum catastrophe. And there's no reason it couldn't happen because that energy is there. These particles, I mean, these uh, photons are actually there. Well, this that sequence up there is a real handy way of adding up the potential energy of all these the ways that pop up out of the out of nothing. Because each one of these has an energy, and you want to add them all up. Like the first number, the one up there, that could be the, uh, to within a multiplicity constant, that could be the energy of the, of the longest wave. Two, that would be the energy of a wave that was half the, half the wavelength, because the energy is inversely proportional to the wavelength. So this would be a, a energy of relative energy of a wave that was half the wavelength of this one. This would be the energy of a wavelength that was one third the wavelength you go down the line, definite number, and you get all, you, you get all the wavelengths. And the sum total of those would be the energy density, called the energy density of the vacuum. That'd be how much energy you could have if all these things came up at once, all these things popped out at once. Okay, well, uh, you know, it's got to be pretty tough for a, a mechanical engineer to design something that would design uh, what, uh, to withstand that kind of work all of them came out at once. So the odds are it doesn't happen because we don't have that problem. We would notice that. If you don't think we would sure notice that. Okay, so we, but we need to tell Jacob we have to give him some value, some energy value here. So that's the sequence that describes the energy density. We want to find what that adds up to. We don't want the infinite result. Okay. You know that that doesn't really happen. So the only other place we've seen this sequence come up with a finite result is Raman Nugent's proof. Now that that Raman Nugent never really said that if you add all the numbers you get from minus one twelve. He said if you go through this chain of reasoning where you end up subtracting two infinite uh, diverging series, one from the other, you can get minus 112. And then later he made it more rigorous, where he said if you, you always get minus 112, if you go through this, you just can't make it equal anything, but you can show it, it's always going to come up minus 112 if you go through this chain of reasoning. So, what the heck? Let's use that value. Let's use that value and let's give that to Jacob. And then and once he has a value for the energy the density in this region, then he can go ahead and start calculating stuff. He said, okay, if we have that particular energy density, then I and if I took these two metal plates and I separated them by some amount, like say 100, 100 uh, atomic diameters, you know, just we're talking close, 100 atomic diameters, two little tiny metal plates. He calculates using that minus 112 figure and putting in all the physical constants and everything, you would get a pressure of 15 pounds per square inch. So he's like, okay, well, we can do that. That's what I'll look for. I'll set this thing up and see what we get. Well, what do you believe? What do you think? You actually do this experiment? You can look this up. That's what you get. <laughs> That's what you get. 15 pounds per square inch if you have it separated by 100 atomic diameters. So, what does that lead you? Why is it what? Huh? <laughs> What's that? I mean, uh, I mean, that's an actual physical result. And the, uh, and so where did this minus 112? There used to be a, a, a book or a, a TV series called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe. And I, that part of that, that had an answer to everything or something. 
42. 42, okay, yeah. that's right, 42. The question is hard, though. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The question is the tricky part. But the answer to everything was 42. Well, here we have a, not an answer to everything, but we have this answer to what's the energy density of nothing. And, uh, good question. So your energy density is like pounds per square inch, you said? Well, you have to, like, to each energy, each, uh, each wave has an energy, uh, like the energy of a photon is the HC over lambda. I mean, it's the Planck's constant times two divided, divided by the wavelength. So you put all that stuff and you start getting actual units. So if you're in a vacuum, the vacuum energy is going to cause the 15 psi. It's going to cause that long. pressure of those plates. It's going to, that energy is going to push these plates together. And the fact that it's a negative uh, is, a, uh, is actually a, means it's going to be an attractive force. So it only, it only gives you the, the magnitude, but also the, uh, gives you the, uh, whether it's attractive or not. Anyway, you, that's the answer you get. So that, that no one really knows where these things are coming from. They're coming out of nothing. Well, what's there? It's just space. They must have, these things must be composed of space, chunks of space or something. The only clue we have as a tangible clue to mathematics is this minus 112. And minus 112 is tied to the Ramanujan's proof and it goes if it's eventually connected, you can show it's connected with number theory, the Riemann beta function, uh, prime numbers, so maybe that's involved somehow, but that's the only clue we have, minus 112. Okay, so I'm going to end on this. The, the minus, you can show you get minus 112 when you have your sequence in various ways. And the, most of them are pretty abstract. Asymptotic, smoothing, cutoff functions, all that great, pretty abstract stuff. When I was researching this story, I came across a non, a non-abstract way of getting minus 112. I want to put that up and I'm just curious if anyone can see any, any possible connection Minus 112 seems to fall, uh, play a similar role as 42 uh, in the Hitchhiker's Guide. It seems to be a clue. It's just a clue. It doesn't tell you anything, but it's a clue. It's a connection. So here's the, uh, here's the, uh, so here's the, uh, the uh, non-abstract uh, uh, way of, uh, of getting that, uh, Getting at this, uh, and it goes back to it goes back to Gauss's formula. Suppose you have this formula. This gives the uh, partial sums and all of that sequence. Now, then suppose you treat this function like if I put n equals one here. What does what does that tell me? What do you get if you put n equals one here? Some of that the partial sum if you only took the first the first term, right? So one, you should get one. Do we get one if we put n equals one here? One times two divided by two. Okay. If we put n equals two, what should we get? Three. Three. Do we get three if we put n equals two here? Two times three to six divided by two. Three. Okay. So if you suppose we took this as a function. Just a function, like a function of x. So if we just define a function, f of x <coughs> equals uh, x times x plus 1 divided by 2. If we plotted this function, what kind of, if we plotted this, what kind of curve is this? Linear, quadratic, cubic, what kind of function is this? It's quadratic. So we should get a parabola if we plotted that. Well, let's, uh, let's suppose we plot that and uh, get a parabola that looks like this. This is the uh, x, x times x1 plus x divided by 2. If you uh, need to check this out, if you put x equals 1, sure enough, you get that the function equals 1, but x equals 2, and the function equals 3. So it's 
state of Boston. Who knows what it would mean to plot it as a continuous variable because the function was really derived with this continuous value, right? Let's just, just say we did. Okay, just for the heck of it. Uh, so this would be the function, and if this is the easy to integrate, it's just a quadratic, it's a parabola, you can integrate this really so there's nothing but finding any kind of stuff. Uh, the area, this could go to, uh, to infinity, it could probably go to infinity, or who knows what it means to plot it in the negative direction, but you can do it, it's a parabola, my goodness. Mm -hmm. and so, and so, uh, the area under this part of the curve would be infinite. The area under this part of the curve would be infinite if you did the whole curve. The area under this part is finite. It's trapped, right? It'd be easy to calculate what that area is. <laughs> and I just happen to have one final uh, uh, Starbucks gift card. And after after the, after this is over, someone will bring out and show me uh, the integration from, of this part of the curve. Show me what it equals. You have to show it. 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 You have to That's not fair. You already got one. Okay. Yeah, I know. That's good. And I probably shouldn't, uh, shouldn't have a. Oh, but why you can't do it? You're just guessing. You didn't calculate it. We're going to educate you guys. Okay, so. Uh, and it but, says in the paragraph. Oh, God. Yeah. 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 But it comes out to be a minus, it's going to be minus because of, by the convention that it's very below the curve or negative, right? It actually comes out to be minus 112 for all <laughs> So, does that mean anything? Is that just a coincidence? I mean, I mean, minus is nothing magical about minus one buck. You can get it in a lot of different ways, but this is actually is kind of tied into this sequence by some partial sums. And yet you get that, you get that uh, integral. It's, it's odd. It just seems kind of peculiar to me that it comes out to be minus one as well. And uh, yeah. you, want, you want to work? Yeah. All right, bring it up after the bring it up after the okay. uh, And the uh, but uh, does anyone uh, see any meaning to that at all? Is it just a, is it just a coincidence? It seemed like that for Rama Nugent to get that result, he had to go through that chain of reasoning where you end up subtracting two uh, uh, diverging sets, okay? And you, you get minus 112. You get minus 112 in a lot of other uh, very abstract ways. Minus 112 seems to definitely associated with this series, uh, and yet this is a very non, that non uh, uh, complicated way of getting it, and yet it comes up like it's one flow. Does anyone see any possible meaning to that? Yeah, I feel like you could arbitrarily pick some values integrated from like, uh, say, B to zero, and you also get any of them. Yeah, you could, but well. this is, Track area. Yeah, so I mean, there's no question. You can't. It's the boundaries are are determined, and uh, you can get minus one twelve. You can arbitrarily. Arbitrarily, yeah, yeah. But this is actually a track thing. Maybe it is just a coincidence. Who knows? I got it on Wolfram Alpha. Okay. All right. <laughs> Step by step solution. <laughs> okay. Well, I think someone might have might have been a little ahead of you. There. So, yeah. <laughs> did you do it by hand? Just yeah, did it by hand. You can okay. Do it by yeah, hand it's, a, it's a pretty easy thing to integrate, right? You can do it by hand. Okay. Well, that's it. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Oh yeah, Robin Newton, if anyone uh, uh, knows the story, he, uh, he, one of the people he sent the letters to uh, was in, uh, in Britain, in uh, Oxford, I think. And uh, uh, Hardy, uh, D.H. Hardy, I think, and uh, what was his buddy's name? Littlewood. Littlewood, yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, they, they looked at that result, and they weren't put off by it, minus 112, because they knew that uh, <laughs> The uh, Riemann data function, and if you evaluate the Riemann data function, which comes from number theory and stuff, 
a, a particular uh, value there, like uh, for the exponent, uh, you do get minus one twelve. So they realize they realize that he had just maybe accidentally stumbled on to a derivation of the Riemann uh, data function, and they realize that maybe this this person has some stuff, uh, you know. But, and it turned out he had a lot of stuff, and they're still trying to they're still trying to figure it out. They're still trying to figure out some of their thinking and their stuff in these notebooks because they keep finding meaning in these things uh, even today. He did find the sponsor. And what of course, the time line is it? What was the time line that went back to happen? Well, it was in 1917, I think, when he, uh, uh, when he first sent this thing out. So it was in the early part of, uh, of the 1900s. And the, uh, what he said, uh, he said 1913. Okay, yeah. yeah 1913. Yeah, 1913. So, uh, so the turn of the century.